your New Year's service right here, my friends. Toastmaster General of the Immoral Majority, and they're all here tonight. New York City, here with me is David Lee Roth. And David, what's your New Year's Eve message? Message? Hold on here. Let me see what you're saying. No, 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 Martha. New Year's Eve massage, darling. It no, says, no, says, it says, no, 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 it says that in the contract. Babe. Look, we came all the way out from Los Angeles, California for this here. I've got the contract. You're here. I'm here. It says New Year's Eve massage. Well, in mine it says message, so you've got to give a message right now, David. <laughs> you know, New Year's Eve for me is not so much... The up and coming year, you know, we're gonna take that day by day, Martha. You know, you gotta decide. It's a dog eat dog world out there, and you gotta decide if you're gonna be a hot dog or a little wiener. Man. Well, David. I personally well, we decide have decided that. to remain a little wiener for one more year. <laughs> we are gonna play your video later on. We're gonna world from your California. Girl. That's right. Watch sports, California girls, and it's live in front of your naked steaming eyes. go. Are you ready? My first guest uh, of the new year is the lead singer of Van Halen, and here is a sample of his latest solo video work. Take a look at the monitor. The round owes a lot of its success to the antics, acrobatics, and lyrics of lead singer David Lee Roth. Not long ago, when he was between tours, I got the chance to talk with him about his music, his career, and his incredible energy. Sound familiar? The lead voice behind the current recycled hit, California Girls, is none other than David Lee Roth the outrageous lead singer of the rock group Van Halen in his first solo outing. Well, jump, jump. Well, For the last 11 years, Van Halen has been a hugely popular, yet widely unheard of band. But the year 1984 changed all of that with the album called 1984, giving the group their first number one pop hit and directing the spotlight squarely on the flamboyant face and physique of David Lee Roth. The whole joy of what we do is being together and communicating that music from each one of us to each other, the four of us. You all are invited. It's the whole experience of being together, of creating together, performing together, arguing together. That whole camaraderie is, is intrinsic to the music. There would be no Van Halen without that. What do you think is the most unique thing that Van Halen brings to rock and roll? Why are you different? I think Van Halen can deal storm and thunder. Van Halen can go down to the beach with a sword in one hand and a torch in the other and still inject a sense of humor. I call Van Halen's music an entire pretense big rock. It, like I said, it's a combination of the gypsy roving carnival, circus, daycare center, uh, you name it. It's everything all wrapped into one. It's a big parade. It's, it's like, it's very festive, you know. You have such a physical act. The things you do on stage are very acrobatic. How do you prepare for a tour? For me, personally, music was always, always primarily physical. Uh, doing things on stage that are difficult to learn, risky to perform, are always the most satisfying to the audience. It's, it smacks of a little bit of homework and a lot of finesse, and, and even more than that, daring. Not, Jeffrey Hines, I'm not Bereshnikov, I'm not trying to achieve a standard of excellence in the dance field or, uh, you know, or the singing field, obviously. <laughs> but I do take it seriously. Van Halen's been criticized a lot for uh, an attitude about women. What would you say is your attitude about women? I think 
that if you listen closely to Van Halen's lyrics, and I have written every single one of them, you won't find one sexist lyric. You won't find one victimizing sort of thinking. You won't find that victimization tact of thought. A lot of people get bitter in this business. Why hasn't that happened to you? I think a lot of people enter this business with a lot of problems already. It's just they're couched and they won't dish them up. They certainly won't dish them up to you in an interview. They come in with a lot of bitterness. They come in with a lot of problems. And then only compound it through drug use, drinking, the stress in terms of hours and responsibilities that are heaped upon them or that they heap upon themselves through excess, laziness, sloth, egotism just like any other major corporation. In that sense, I guess it is. What about anything you'd change about your life? I don't think there'd really be anything that I would change in my life. Sure, there's little bits and pieces, you know, everybody's a you know, Tuesday morning quarterback, you know. But uh, I think I've made steady progress. Seems like it's progress. And maybe, like I said, in North Dallas, for you, things don't get any better and they don't get any worse, but they sure got different. And that's good enough for me. Do you think you'll ever be married? Absolutely. I could definitely imagine myself married. But I'd, it would take a very, very strong woman to deal with me. What makes you happiest in life? What makes me the happiest in life? I sell smiles for a living. Here, half one free. That looks good on you. That's what makes me happy. Have another word for breakfast. And have one yourself, David Lee. Thanks for joining us this morning. David Lee Roth says he plans to cut back on his touring schedule and devote more time to his film career. The singer has already appeared in a number of movies under his stage name, Anne Bancroft. <laughs> We got Radio 1990. We asked him for a list of his favorite videos. Now's your chance, Paul. Tell us about one of them. Well, I'll tell you, if everybody had a sense of humor, we'd probably get through life a lot better, and especially to get through this rock and roll lifestyle. That's one thing you've got to have. And uh, you better believe David Lee Roth has a great sense of humor, and you'll see it a lot in this video. This is just a gigolo. For 72 hours, that's three solid days this Memorial Day weekend. The first sign, the first sure sign of a nervous breakdown is thinking that your work is terribly important. That's why it's a long weekend. No work, no nervous breakdown. Just Dave and his penetrating insights. Like a virgin. Every hour in the music news this coming weekend, starting Friday night at 6 p.m. Eastern. Wake up, America! We're proposing a toast! It's the David Lee Roth weekend! Right here on MTV! <laughs> My producer, the famous Fred Frimpleton. Uh, and, you know, Fred coached me. He taught me everything that I know oh, about uh, video. Well, you only tell the truth, you know that. You know, the definition of video is an advertising tool that gets people to suspend their intelligence long enough to sell them a couple million records. And I think this is a philosophy that MTV has really pioneered, brought to the forefront of at least the American consciousness. The winner is... One of the two most difficult things to deal with in life, I think, is probably failure and success, you know? So it's not something you really want to you want to wait around for. It's not something you really want to, you know, shoot at. You know, you're just going to do your best thing. And then, uh, you know, hopefully it's going to get out there. Maybe you're going to win a trophy, MTV. Oh, man. Look at all the people here tonight. Yeah. Step in rock videos will probably be the box step. <laughs> judging about, judging by how many people are going back into time now, you know, and they're pulling out the old Gene Kelly and the Fred Astaire stops and etc. Cetera, etc. Cetera. And I, I see everybody doing fast motion now with the Keystone Cops type of effect, you know, and they're going farther and farther back in film. Pretty soon we'll be back to silent movies, you know. Pretty back. Pretty soon we'll be back to radio. <laughs> Stay tuned for more Dave. In the next hour, ooh, it's even going to be better. <laughs> I don't know, sweetheart, have I accomplished everything I wanted to do by the end of this interview? I think we have a few more things to do. Is there a master plan for your career, Dave? Do you have a master plan, sweetheart? Do you? 
<laughs> do you get worried about being burnt out with overexposure? No way. <laughs> no problem with overexposure here, Joe. Hey! Whatever you do, don't take your eyes off that screen because... It's the David Lee Roth Weekend! <laughs> Well, people say to me, Dave, why did you do a solo album, you know? And I'm sitting here, Barney's Beanery, with my famous producer, the famous <laughs> Fred Frimpleton here. And I remember back when I started to broach the subject about doing a solo album, and Fred said, do a solo record, Dave. Don't be humble. You're not that great. <laughs> Actually, what happened is we had a long weekend. You know, we were down in Mexico, and uh, I've been carrying around those songs in my suitcase for some period of time. And... Uh, you know, the Beach Boys tune came on. I said, that's right, that's it. People say, Dave, how come you only chose to do four songs? And I told him before, I says, look, any record that you're going to go buy is only going to have three or four good cuts on it to begin with, right? So all I did is trim off the flab and sell it to you for less. You know, every kind of song has, uh, you know, one of them's athletic, one of them's sweaty, one of them's intellectual, you know. Which one are you, baby? Mm, intellectual. <laughs> <laughs> Let's have a hand for that. <laughs> well, I had a very short childhood, Joe. You know, I was born at a very early age and raised even faster. When I was younger, I was an honor student, you know. Uh, I remember very vividly many, many times saying, yes, your honor, no, your honor. Uh, yes, I was here last week, your honor. I think of all the education that I've Manny gave me my first pair of mirror sunglasses. I was 10 then. And uh, getting, th getting those through the third grade without taking them off before recess was a tribulation. I remember I discovered Brill Cream at the time, you know, and doing headstands for the girls. I guess things never really changed, you know. <laughs> Jeez, they said I was hyperactive, you know. I'd start ticky-tacking on the forks and knives on the table, you know. Singing the favorite songs from the television commercials. And everybody said, this cat has flipped. Nothing's changed. I still do monkey hour, except now I charge. People say, you know, why'd you pick the songs that you do, Dave? Why did you, why did you choose something like Easy Street, you know? Easy Street to me is like the bar. It's the red lights, it's the pretty girls. Didn't I help you? Didn't I help you on that? The pretty you girls, know you know? <laughs> and it's kind of it's take your clothes off kind of music. Coconut Grove is where we go to review the whole subject. You know, Coconut Grove is one of those times when you ponder and summarize. When we got to Just a Gigolo, it's like Louis Prima threw the ball in 1940. And your worst nightmare came true. Diamond Dave caught it and ran for a million record set. Without me, just a gigolo, and everywhere I go. Start out as a very slow, quiet, sad song, you know? When Marlene and Dietrich sang it and everything, it was just like, you know, really, I'm just a gigolo, and everywhere I go. Whoa. Okay. I figured, you know, we'll come out in the middle of the winter with a song about California girls and we'll make the video in Broadway 1920. They're all dream songs, you know. All my stuff is gonna fly now. I'm a hopeless optimist, man. When I go fishing, I take a Nikon and a frying pan, baby. A little spark. And they wait for the audience to generate the little spark, you know. Uh, that's where I come in. I bring a flamethrower. I bring my new Junior Miss flamethrower with the easy long throw attachment. <laughs> I see my whole career as a circus, but I'm, I'm sort of the ringmaster, you know? I, I picture myself as the ring leader here, you know? It's, I, I feel like I'm Toastmaster General of the Immoral Majority, you know? Our motto is, ah, shut up. Dave, how did California Girls come about? Dave! Dave is Dave, what are you doing here at your house oh, and your pool? Oh, man. I'm what trying to do an interview with the people at MTV, man. Right here? I'll stay. Go ahead. Ladies Go ahead. and gentlemen, Mr. Pedro Picasso, yours truly, Dave Picasso, and Forget together we are the Picasso brothers. brothers. We're the ones responsible for the video schmack that's been wrecking your wrecking TV set for the last year and a half. 
Actually, I'm mostly the one responsible. That's where he's wrong. I do almost everything that deals with the taste. Who's the uh, genius behind the California Girls video? I was. And uh, the Gigolo video? I was. Um, I was reading in a magazine that there were budgetary problems on both those videos. Who's responsible for that? He was. He was. The creative process between Pete Angelus and myself is kind of, you know, we argue. <laughs> and we go back and forth and back and forth. Generally, though, I am the responsible party. When something goes wrong, I am responsible. Uh, I think Pete will testify to that probably later on in this very same interview. But in a team, usually one person's stronger than the other person. Who is the more creative out of the two of you? I am. I think it's obvious. Sit down, Waldo. I think there's a little bit of Waldo inside of everybody. You know? When you put a character like Waldo on the screen, everybody's going to relate to him, but ain't nobody's going to admit it. Now, how much Waldo do you think is in my attorney, Julius? Waldo is all me. Can't you dig it? <laughs> I do the videos to have something to do during the commercials. <laughs> it's sort of, it's kind of thing where you're going to have a fantasy, man, and you're going to paint it up with the best characters that you possibly can, and then you're going to try and, uh, you know, do something on the screen with it. Cut it! I don't think any single character is is a is created out of one person. You know, it's a conglomeration. You know, you say, well, what about the crazy Italian manager? You know, the guy who's always grabbing his crotch, you know, and like that. Isn't that really one person? Forget about it, Dave. No, it's a combination of that I know personally. And, uh, you know, they ask about, you know, <laughs> the girls and so on and all the stereotypes. And no, they are, they are combinants. They are, you know, conglomerations of several different kinds of people that you put into one tube top and spike heels. Why did you come up with that concept for the video? Spike heels? What are you, wise guy? <laughs> we have the winner of the last weekend here tonight. It's not a question so much of who came up with the Lost Weekend concept as to how I wound up on a Lost Weekend. Clear jet spending money, backstage, loud music, limousines. A Lost Weekend with Van Halen. People ask me all the time, they say, Dave, what happened to the winner, Kurt Jeffries, of the famous Lost Weekend? Kurt, you're number one, too! Yeah. I loved it. I freaking loved it, man. <laughs> <laughs> and I understand that Kurt and his new wife, Bambi, are living in Detroit. <laughs> joke, that's a joke. I feel that the Lost Weekend is something that I truly did win. You know, the, the, the darndest thing about miracles is they're so dang unpredictable. One, two, three, it's clap to you till we meet. Ba -ba 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 -ba. did get home. Oh, really? That's great, boy. I oh, like to feel you? a part of that. <laughs> One of the uh, biggest signs of an approaching nervous breakdown is taking one's work and thinking that it's very important. I think a lot of people think and take myself, my music, a lot more seriously than I do. I think that's part of rock and roll. It's just, you just got to you go with it. You know, a lot of people look in the mirror. They have trouble dealing with what they really see there. I never look in the mirror. I've always wanted to be an outrage to public decency and a threat to women, you know. I figure it's good work if you can get it, and that's why I joined up in the Rock and Roll Legion. I don't know about my image for the fans, you know, I kind of do what I do, be what myself, and when people have respect for you, when they have admiration, that means that you look just like they do. You just gotta sail forward. You're gonna make your music, you're gonna make your show, you're gonna do the very best you can. And if the eyes of God are smiling upon you, then one day, boom, it's Miller time. If I had a formula for any of this nonsense, we'd all be managers, man. <laughs> I don't know, I don't know, what's the formula? You know, part of going on the road, part of the thrill, the mystique, the behind-the-scenes glitter, glamour, and tinsel that is Hollywood show business is making new friends out on the road. Smile, you're on a candid camera!
perfect tour is one that goes on forever, man. You know, they say, what goes on stage? You know, they say the world is a stage. It's definitely a stage for me. You know, we say we have a good time on the road when we go on stage. I tell you, babe, when I go on stage, we have a good time on stage, under the stage, backstage, and particularly in the front of the stage. <laughs> You know, when you start out and you're young and you got all your parents and all your friends and girlfriends and everybody, you tell them, yeah, I'm going to be in rock and roll. Everybody says, forget it. You know, you, you be the one in a zillion to make it up there. And it's like you got to put it all up on the table. You know, you put your social life, you know, you're going to put whatever kind of educational background, you know, and you're going to put up all those things that qualify as normal existence. They go right up onto the table, just like at Blackjack, man. And you stand a good chance of coming up 20. 22, you know, so you put it all up on the table and everybody says, oh, you're throwing your life away. Oh, we feel sorry for you. Oh, no, you're making us very sad. And if you're the one in a million, man, the one in a million who go, bah, and you come in at the top 10, then they all, half of them are going to turn right around and go, don't you feel overpaid for what you do, Dave? Don't you think that you're overcompensated for the minute amounts of time that you put into your Well, hey, I work hard for this. Oh, people ask the questions about love versus sex, sex versus love, you know, love making, even when you're at your best, only lasts eight or nine hours. Then you gotta have a relationship, you know? Just that you belong, and everywhere I go, people know the part I'm playing. What kind of women does Dave like? You know, people always remind me about my, my wild man image, you know, that party monger image, party monster image, you know. I tell you the truth, I've been seeing the same girl for the last four, maybe five days. How and about people, that? <laughs> and people are still reminding me about my wild image. The last girl I met actually was a one-man girl, but I guess I wasn't the man. You asked me, what was it like the first time? The first time it was with a girl who didn't speak English, and the whole time she kept saying, I like it, I like it. I was waiting for love it, you know? I've had a complex ever since. <laughs> One of them is me. Famous Italian director, Pete Picasso, brother of Dave Picasso. The other one is... David Lee Roth! Now sit tight, go order yourself some Italian food, because we're going to be back with more of... The David Lee Roth Weekend! Forget about it. All right, everybody, i got to have this suit back by six. Let's try and get it right. Everybody's got their own definition of art. I think it's more lifestyle. I think it's more your attitude than what you put on a piece of canvas, you know? I think it's more than just what you go ahead and carve out of a piece of clay or some sort of sound that you make for the purpose of putting on a record, you know? I think it's, it's your whole approach, you know? It's how you feel, you know? And you gotta live with that fury. You gotta have a little bit of that sense of humor, a little bit of that tenderness, and then, you know, Whatever you do is going to be art. The way you walk, the way you talk, the way you interact with other people, everything's going to be art then. He's an original. Just ask him. In fact, ask him anything and he'll have an opinion. His opinion on life is that it should be a party. That California boy image has been carefully calculated by this larger-than-life personality who uses rock and roll as a forum for his flamboyant showiness. As you'll see, very little gets in the way of David Lee Roth, a one-man tour de force and one of the real men of rock. As long as you had the right haircut and the right shoes and, and the right balance of musical ability and sense of humor, that's rock and roll. He's been playing the part of David Lee Roth with great success for a long time. Over 12 years and six platinum albums with his former group Van Halen. And as a solo artist for the past year. But his personality transcends the music. This is the 80s. Okay, this is high tech, right? And you want to dial in, you want to see a radio sitting here or a color television set. You know, you got eyes as well as ears. It is showbiz. I like color. 
to me, that's the greatest. You want to wear black on black, that's great, you know. But I like Technicolor. I like parades. Your life has sort of been a parade. I, I feel like the guy at the end of the fire truck more than in a parade, you know, <laughs> the steering wheel. I have some control, but not complete control. <laughs> I learned in, in, in the fairly recent past that, uh, you know, if you have the ability to stand up and say, you're right. <laughs> and move on to something else, then you're gonna learn quicker. You're gonna make a better, better art, whether that's oil painting or finger painting. I think rock and roll is both. What do you mean? Well, you take it very seriously, and at the same time, a lot of what you paint winds up on the refrigerator door. So, <laughs> so you're just gonna figure, oh, all right, what I'm doing lies somewhere in between. I don't think rock or what I do at least is entirely disposable. But at the same time, it's not Mona Lisa. It's Mona Lisa with a mustache. His much-publicized breakup with Van Halen ended with some bitter feelings. But Roth is now busy recording an album due out this summer. If you liked just a gigolo and that kind of element, you're not going to be disappointed. But if you like, boom, that kind of music, we got it in spades, you know. I went out and, you know, and the reason I bailed out of the Van Halen band was because they didn't want to, they didn't want to go to bat anymore, you know. They started getting a little more domesticated, which is okay, you know. The guys are all married now, getting some kids, you know, and doing like that, which I guess is the natural thing. Maybe I'm the aberration. Maybe I'm the exception to the rule, you know, but I wanted to travel. I want to go everywhere. And I want to go with a bunch of people, a big bunch of people. And I like rehearsal, well, so let's spend way too much on it. And let's, <laughs> and let's redecorate the tour bus and let's go out and see everything because we can do it now. And in this business, it's here today, gone later today. That's, oh, that's why I stay out here so long. That's why I stayed in the business so long. You know, most bands fold up dead by four or five years. You know that. And it's, you know, we doubled that already. And we keep going stronger and stronger. I said start from scratch time, nine years after the fact. So, yeah, that testifies my enthusiasm for people. But other than that, I want nothing. I like city noise, stink pavement, uh -uh, or I want nothing. I want the biggest decision in my life to be should I turn over like this in the sun? More like that. <laughs> and I've got really protect that. That's why you never see pictures of me in my private life. What was little David Lee Roth like? What were you like when you were a kid? I was just like this, but with the sunglasses. <laughs> <laughs> Uncle Manny gave me my first pair of mirror sunglasses when I was 10 years old and taught me how to wear them after dark. Uncle Manny had... Uh, a club in Greenwich Village called the Cafe Wa W H A with a question mark. Like, what? <laughs> I got my first radio when I was six, seven years old, and I wanted to be the DJ too. I wanted to be the cat singing, and I wanted to be the DJ. And uh, you know, when I saw comic books, man, for the first time, I wanted to be Superman, and I wanted to be the cat who drew him. You know, I could differentiate. Yeah, I'd throw myself off the balcony. I still do, but now I make a living at it. My very special guest, David Lee Roth, to Radio 1990. Yes, Radio 1990 is very popular in my country. People watching all time. And gets really successful. That's when other problems surface. You know, up until you know, six, eight months ago, Van Halen was entirely my life. All the things that were involved there, all these ancillary things, you know, the video world, the whatever, the wardrobe, you know, the... You name it, the staging, the live, the advertising, you know, that would that, that'd be my life, you know. And then, uh, you know, change the system, you know, you gotta start changing the way we're gonna go about our business, you know. And uh, I stopped having all. I always said the bands, bands, the band, all bands are very fragile units, you know. And, there, and everybody, I always said, we have four very different personalities. I never misconstrued the situation, you know. And uh, it just came to a parting of the ways. Not so much about the music, you know. It was about, you know, how we were going to go about making your life. The you know, flick's going to be great, you know. We wrote it, directing, directing, acting in it, and the whole thing. And I figure it's going to be great. And if it comes out great, then, you know, Siskel and Ebert are going to get on the tube and they're going to go, oh, bright new young star on the horizon, you know, somebody to watch for, you know, uh, you know, a stroke of whatever like this. 
And if it turns out stinky, which is always a possibility, then they'll get up there and they'll go, hey man, who gave these schmoes 10 million bucks to get drunk, man, and go out in the tropics and make what amounts to a home movie with a bunch of beautiful girls? And isn't that rock and roll? Welcome my special guest on TV 2000, David Lee Roth part of my brain's out. And as I look back now, America, I, as I look back on it now, I can tell you, I had a f great time. <laughs> I made a lot of bucks real early in my life. Coming about 1980 is when I turned. And for about three years, man, I partied my brains out in terms of spirit, you know. People are not going to record, just, they're not going to remember whether you hit the note perfect or whatever, unless you're a really great singer, which I'm not, you know, but they're going to record your spirit, though. History will record the spirit, and say, man, did he go to the moon on that one? <laughs> Any of you little studs out there who never sat there and got thought you're thinking about getting hot for teacher at some point in your educational regime. For all these years, Van Halen was your life. Now it seems like the solo career and the records and the band whatever you put together the movie that's your life you don't have room in your life still for a girlfriend or you tried it once and it didn't work out <clears throat> well i what i did was sort of foolish you know i just everybody was starting to get married and everybody was starting to get their girlfriends you know and everybody was starting like this and come off the road you know from the band and uh you know, I'm always traveling, you know, I'm always either uh, on the road or I'm off in the jungle somewhere, or, you know, or in the city, you know, I like, I'm always moving around. And uh, I saw everybody doing it, so I didn't have a girlfriend, I thought, I'll give it a shot. <laughs> <laughs> so I did the MTV commercials for The Lost Weekend, you know, and there were two girls sitting there, you know, when we did the commercial, I looked over, and I'm right-handed, you know, and I looked over, and I said, you're it? <laughs> no. It was just as discriminating as that. Oh, come on, you know, it's like out of a book, you know, I mean, you know, I go like that. So, okay, we were very conversant after a while, it was a beautiful kid. So, from there, I don't know, you know, I'm, you stay busy, you know, you be working and working and stuff. Plus, you know, when I broke up with my last girlfriend, when you break up with somebody that you love like that, then, uh, that's God's way of telling you it's time to go out and make a million bucks and <laughs> get busy. <laughs> you did not leave this band though to go become a movie star as well. Oh, that's Q. ridiculous. No, Edward says that because he wants you to be pissed at me. He wants he wants you to dislike me just as much as he does, you know. And he's gonna come and he says, Yeah, well he wants to be a movie star, so you think of all you rock cats and kitties out there, you're gonna turn around and go, in and Dave, he's turning into Sting, he thinks he's like the Frankenstein, that, you know, and come like that. Hey, man, you know, I'm gonna make a movie, look, after seven and a half years of a blistering neon plastic, a 33 and a third, you know, and go like that. Can I make a movie, one? <laughs> I go, and we make a movie. And it'll take me, what, how many months? And we get a beautiful new record out of it, and we'll smear the music all over the movie, and then we're going to go on tour, and we're never going to come in. So fast, you got the five-inch windshield, and you got one hand on the windshield, and one hand on the driving wheel like this. You got your head down. Come on, I missed half the country, man. David Lee Roth was on the tour. this one. I kind of I figured that this is going to hit a chord in people, because it's rocking, but it's not rock and roll. It makes you feel like movement, but it's not really rock and roll. Got away with it, you know? Got to make that left turn. People say, oh, I'm just going to go make rock and roll, man. It's going to sound like rock without Eddie. <laughs> you know? And it's not going to be as good. It won't have the personality and come like that. So I had to say, ah, you know, I'm going to make the quick move. And it's Roth, cross the finish line again. That's when the trouble starts, because it's all those years that you're really working towards something, and kind of when you get there and you have a minute to stop and relax is when real fighting starts. I mean, yeah, well, some of us don't stop and relax. You know, some of us don't stop and pat ourselves on the back and build monuments to ourselves in our backyard. Is that what you're saying Eddie did? The last interview I read with Eddie, he... he put himself in the same bracket with Beethoven. I 
I'm really hesitant to start airing this dirty laundry in the public, you know, becomes like a big soap opera, a running soap opera in the trades and in the press and everything. And I'm not against soap operas at all, you know. And you know that sometime in the future, near future probably, I won't come up with a real good soap opera for all of you out there in television land. But when I do, you can rest assured that I'm going to provide you with somewhat brighter stars than Ed and Val. Stand to wake up in the morning. The reason I'm going slow here is because I can't remember the last time I got up in the morning. <laughs> no, I hate waking up and not having something to do. I gotta, I gotta go, man. I gotta, you know, gotta be active, gotta accomplish something. I don't know. You know, gotta be a shining example. I'm not sure of what, you know, <laughs> but we gotta go. And uh, things were just starting to slow down with the band, you know. It was a Take time, you know, take more time. I want to go in the studio for a year. The studio for a year? I don't I can't stand the inside of the studio anyways from the beginning, you know. Mess up my tan, you know. <laughs> and, and I says, so what's the payoff, you know? He says, yeah, it'll take about a year maybe to get in the studio, you know, make the new record a year. Yeah, what's the payoff? Because you know I like to do it on two legs, you know. I want to dance, you know. I want to move around, you know, and I want to talk to you. <laughs> I'm even going to come on, I'm at your back door, man. I'm inside your body, just like my words are right now, man. That's where I'm coming from. And he says, yeah, well, we play stadiums. Stadiums? You can't hear my jokes in between the songs, you know. You get up some cool shoes or something. You can't see the shoes unless you have some 80X binoculars, you know, some desert rat binoculars trying to look up there. It's like the Michael Jackson show. Next. Oh, come on, that's a hell of a payoff, buddy. You know? And then we're going to produce ourselves the kiss of death. <laughs> you know? Love Teddy Templeman. I work real well with Teddy, you know. Always have. Geez, the last album, God, it almost took four days. <laughs> you know, we put preparation up for it, but four days' time, you know, to make the record. I said, I got to step aside from it, guys, you know. I got to step aside from right of it, you know. I, I think, uh, you know, they're looking for these kind of sanctions against, oh, who's going to decide, you know, who, what, what's, a, what's a sexual content of a lyric, you know. Somebody could potentially just look at the screen of this TV show and say, Way Roth was dressed as a sexual statement <laughs> and rate the show R or X. Who's going to decide what is violent? You know, who's going to decide what is obscene and like that? Same housewives who are, in, who are spearheading the movement? You know, what's going to happen when you start go from that? You know, and that's going to, everybody's going to have to start bowing to the system because you know what happened. As if you get a big X on your album, then all those mom and pop stores down in the Bible Belt and everybody, they're gonna, they don't want to put up the thing in the window. They're not going to put up a record that says X, you know, in the window and advertise that they peddle porn rock, you know, and go like that. So everybody's going to be going in the studio, you know, when they're writing and everything, they're going to be going, oh, we better clean this up. Uh, we better make this all right. Otherwise, we're not going to be able to sell our records, you know. And it's just going to... It's going to be like Brooke Shields on acid, man. <laughs> Everybody's going to be like Donny Osmonding themselves. You know, rock and roll show, at least my show, is not like Broadway. It's not exactly the same from moment to moment, beat to beat, as it were. And what happens if in Milwaukee, I have a couple of beers that made Milwaukee famous, you know, and I start speaking about something wild night I might have had out in a hotel room or something like that. Just out of the whole tour, just leap into that story. And there's the board of directors or whoever they are, you know, sitting in the audience. They go, this show is X-rated. You know, the whole rest of the tour is going to be X-rated. Uh, what is this? The PMRC, the people who are lobbying, you know, about uh, rating song lyrics and rating records, you know, like they do movies and that, are screaming and yelling, and I'm going to cover a People magazine, and, and, you know, there's three pictures of me and four mentions in the, in the article, and the whole, the whole gist of everything about Dave Roth is about, what is the song, Hot for Teacher. Which makes me give me a little chuckle, just the title does anyway. <laughs> and uh, that song is, what, two years old now? 
you know, <laughs> come away with stuff they're probably dancing to down at the Elks Club, right? Uh, I ain't got nobody. Remember this one, Harriet? You know, <laughs> they're going like this. <laughs> they're probably dancing to it and don't even know that I sang the same, that I sang both tunes, you know? performer talks about his art. I don't care, you know, who's the author and like that. You know, for me, I was listening to music on the radio long before the Beatles popped up, you know, when I was, doo, you know, just as big as the dial. Oh, <laughs> God, you know, I was listening to the radio. And then when the Beatles come along and they wrote their own songs, they wrote their own songs. You know, it was like that was something really new. That had never been done before, you know, and you had all the other artists, you know, the Elvises, the Sinatras, these people who write their own tunes. And the Beatles started that out. And the British invasion come up and everybody says and the Americans started saying, Hey, I can do that too. Well actually having at the same time, you know, Beach Boys were doing their own thing. But, you know, before that that was unheard of, you know. And, uh, you know, I don't care, I never did who wrote the tunes, man. I don't care about it, if I did it or not. You know, I love to sing them, I like to dance them, you know. I see it in terms of spirit, you know. People are not going to record, just, they're not going to remember whether you hit the note perfect or whatever, unless you're a really great singer, which I'm not. You know, but they're going to record your spirit, though. History will record the spirit. And they say, man, did he go to the moon on that one? <laughs> he screwed it all up, but what effort. <laughs> and that's, you know, I guess that's how, that's what's making it tick for me now. Yeah, we'll try something with some brass, because I heard this old tune, you know, just a gigolo back in a little dive bar in Huntsville, Alabama, and went up and asked the guy, he says, yeah, that's Louis Prima, man. There's a checkup on Louis Prima. He made a gleeby music. Is that what he called his music when he used to have a dab doo ba Italian guy. But he didn't write the song. It comes from back in, what, 1914? Something like that, right around after the World War I. It used to be a very sad song. And it was about the German officers that come up, you know, back from the war, and they're forced to become gigolos in order to retain that real stanchion pose, you know, with the, you know, real fancy and like that with the hair brushed like that. And uh, they're forced to become gigolos and the cat sings a song in a theater production, in a play, where he hangs up his jacket and he sings it very sad. He goes, oh, just, it's, you know, it's, it's, it's very sad. And, and that's my way, is to take something like that and make it, I can, you know, <laughs> show you the other five sides of the coin and you can make that almost a victory song. <laughs> How about if you go in this place or you go to that place and she just stays home and then you can come home to her and like that, you know? I said that. Yeah. yeah, but that's not, that's not sharing. That's not sharing the experience. Then you become an audience. Then you, then you have just another member of an audience. How was it? It was pouring rain. We were so, you know, and it's, that's like, you know, that's, that's not a partner, you know? That's certainly not somebody Who's gonna cover your back? If I get up first thing, you know, I go out. If I'm not training for something, I get ready for a trip or something like that, then I'm flying around. I'm going to different places. You stay active, you stay vital. And you know, you want somebody who can stay up with you, who can keep with you on that, you know? It's hard, you know, the last girl that I was with, we went through some, you know, we went through, uh, we went with first white kids to cross over the Star Mountains in New Guinea, you know? And that was a big, uh, that's a big thing to share with somebody, you know. And then come away from that, you know. I got right involved in the movie thing and with the band, you know, and putting together the new show and like that. It's easy to bury yourself in your work, you know. And I, I do spend a tremendous amount of uh, my free time by myself, you know. Whether I'm off, you know, traveling or whether, you know, it's just hanging out at the house. A day, baby! How you doing? Look at all the people here tonight! <laughs> Boy, is that a cool car or what? Hey, congratulations, congratulations. Thanks. Thanks a lot. Is that a rental or do you own that baby? I gotta have it back by six, P. <laughs> Dad, what, you just come in from Hawaii? This is Hollywood, baby. That's right, and here we are in Hollywood Boulevard at the Woo! world famous Chinese Theater. Good luck to you, Pee Wee. Thanks a lot. Thanks for coming, Dave. <laughs> yeah, I, I got no problems with that. Pee Wee, Woo! he's got his technique down. Dave, I don't know if you caught Pee Wee lining up the women and, uh, and giving them the old, you know, 
the wet ones. Well, Pee Wee and certainly has a way with women. Pee Wee certainly has a way with the movies. Pee Wee certainly has a way with whatever you want to call it, man. What a movie! Woo! Let me ask you, Dave. Uh, do you have any? Would you perhaps have any uh, improvements on Pee Wee's kissing techniques? Any sort of, you know, uh, yeah, I would pointers? improve on who he's kissing, you know, but it's just. <laughs> That's just a matter of taste, you know. So. Would you consider yourself more in the, the in terms of film, let's say, uh, past and future, would you consider yourself more in the Rambo or Pee Wee tradition? Well, you know, I am wearing my brand new Rambo jockey shorts, Mark, you know. It's a little pictures of Rambo with his crossbow running all. I'd show you, but this is PG-13 tonight, you know. It says, I'm coming for you. <laughs> now, the big question here, as far as I'm concerned, is when are we going to be doing the David Lee Roth, Pete Angelus premiere party. Well, actually, what's going to be happening is we've been in the studio, we've been putting together music, we're headed for the road, and we're going to make this movie up, probably start pre-production within the next four weeks. You know, Warner Brothers is this close, so we're going to, you know, we're headed right on. So it's movie and record. You mentioned record briefly, right? Kind of like Purple Rain in reverse. Man. All right. Tonight, we're here for the premiere party of Pee-wee's Big Adventure. And what would a movie be without music? What we've got for you is a video called Big Adventure done by Allie Willis with local support and Bye. vocal support by uh, Pee Wee Herman. I can't read tonight. Yeah. Um, Allie, by the way, wrote Neutron Dance for the Pointer, the Pointer Sisters. Sisters. So you here's the world Dave. premiere of Big Adventure. It says roll tape. Thanks for bailing <laughs> me out, Dave. I was really involved in the flick and I really cared about the characters and I really cared about the storyline and everything until the bicycle started to fly. <laughs> and I'm on the rocks and I've been in the studio with Teddy Templeman and we've got a whole host of musicians, you know, are contributing songs. We're going to make a record and we're going to go on the road and we're never going to come home. Been in the studio, we've been putting together music, we're headed for the road, and we're gonna make this movie up, probably start pre-production within the next four weeks. You know, Warner Brothers is this close, so we're gonna, you know, we're headed right on. So it's movie and record. You mentioned record briefly, right? Kind of like Purple Rain in reverse. Saying David Lee Roth wouldn't sing his material, it's too melodic, Eddie told us. If he can't scream over it, he has trouble. Uncore. Diamond Dave had called up and found we were in town and invited us over to the lot. We went over and saw him, said hello. He showed us the storyboard. It was fantastic. And he said, he said, I would love it if you'd write something for us. So we said, why, well, certainly, sire. Certainly, Roth has taken his charisma to New York. Has apparently been hanging out, partying at the Palladium and getting some street vibes for his upcoming album. Dave is recording the record right now in a New York studio with his new band. And producer Ted Templeman should be out in time for summer. We got the new band all tied together. We're going to be announcing that real soon. We're in the studio now with Ted Templeman. And, geez, the soundtrack, the, the music, everything, all the songs and everything done up by the band. And we're well into it. In fact, we're headed into the stretch on the new record. It's not going to be what you expect. Now, David Lee Roth unleashed Crazy from the Heat, his first solo EP, and capped his way from the California beach to video vaudeville. Hollywood beckoned, and now Dave is casting his own Crazy from the Heat movie. We have all the union problems that all the big movies have, you know? I have all the problems with the talent on the set going, oh, Dave, I can't do this scene. What's my motivation? You know, many times I stop and I ask myself, the same question. <laughs> but what about Van Halen? Life goes on without me. Rumors of Roth's departure started right after the solo record came out. And by midsummer, sure enough, Dave was gone, replaced by a Sammy Hagar. Hagar album. We asked him what he thinks of Van Hagar, and he says that he finds them none too original. I heard half of that music in the movie The Wildlife. You know, that was from two years ago. Half of the half of the music that's on the Van Halen record is from two years ago. So you know, I forgot what I thought about it. <laughs> it's, it's just been reworked into some songs. <laughs> well, now Van Halen have raised some eyebrows by their refusal to do a video for Why Can't This Be Love, and Dave has a thought on why that artistic decision was made. It's because they're ugly. <laughs> Peak entrance of all. On a bet, he drove across the country in his 1951 Mercury Lowrider in just three days. 
This whole bet is California spirit, man. We're coming in for the MTV Awards. And I was talking with my producer, Teddy Templeman, and he asked me if I still had that old red bomb. And I told him, yeah, it's all polished up and sharp. He said, that thing won't even get you to L.A., Dave. I told him, now it's you, Teddy. I says, I can get that thing all the way to the Atlantic Ocean. He says, nonsense. I says, $1,000 says I do. He says, nonsense. I says, 2000 says. He says, nonsense. I said, five. He said, you're on. <laughs> We've made our victory in New York this week. If anything comes from MTV, it's icing on the cake. Only one person has seen every performance. He's our next presenter, and his name is David Lee Roth. Let's hear it. Oh, look at all the people here tonight. Yeah, everybody's all dressed up and everything. I say... Take a look at these podiums here, man. If you check this out, Griles, give me a back shot so we can see the podiums here. You know what this looks like, man? It looks like 20 minutes after a dinosaur ate the Count Basie band right here. <laughs> you know, a lot of you are probably wondering how the hell I wound up giving best female performance, man. Women's groups are all over my case, man. They're talking chauvinist, misogynist, and all this kind of stuff. I think, oh... Father, forgive me, I have sinned. Let me count the ways. Yeah, like, That's two different poems, isn't it? Yeah. yeah anyway, I always thought, you know, that the, the rock video business is a little, too, a little too important to take seriously. You know, as my many years as the touring musician, you know, we've seen many a female performance. I don't know if I have the same criteria as uh, Park Waterhouse does, you know, for picking this here. Anyways... <laughs> I'm having a great time. What about you out here? <laughs> the nominees for best female performance are... <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, the winner, best female performance, I give you, weighing in at 200 zillion record sales, very, very dangerous, the fabulous Tina Turner! Earlier in the show, we, uh, we heard from the new Van Halen, who have been out on the road this year with Sammy Hagar singing all those songs that Dave used to. But that doesn't mean Sammy's the only one singing them. On Diamond Dave's Eat Em and Smile Road show, he's not only doing his solo material, but also plenty of Van Halen favorites like Jump, uh, Panama, and Unchained. Because I wrote half those tunes. Not half of every... Not of all the songs, only half of the songs that I write, every Van Halen song that you ever heard up till lately, I wrote half of. So, you know, when you hear my voice singing, it's not really singing, you know? So it's like, when I heard the news, baby, all about your disease, what do you call that? You know, certainly not poetry. <laughs> Wrap your mouth on that, Sammy. You know, you don't work music, you play it. We used to work. Since leaving the band, David Lee Roth has released a solo album and is currently on tour. He has spent the last few months exchanging insults with Van Halen in the press and has his own version of the breakup. Well, what happened with Van Halen is one of the big reasons I left is because of the dishonesty in the band there. Dave wouldn't allow our wives up there. That's the oldest excuse in the book. How many musicians of you out there watching right now have sat backstage, you turn to the lead singer and say, hey, my baby doesn't, I don't want her to come tonight. Uh, I'll tell her you said just she couldn't come. Is there anything the public doesn't understand about you? Probably the biggest misconception about what we do here and what I'm about is that we don't take this music seriously. This music is not kid stuff. As far as making the music serious, yeah, I take this, this music dead serious and I take what I do very very seriously but i have a dang good time doing it doing it doing it doing it thanks again dave when we come if it's got music if it has rhythm 
then I got to stand up. I'm the guy next to you on the turnpike, on the freeway, you know, the one who's playing the air guitar, you know, and doing the air drums, you know, and carrying on with his sing the chorus, and I'm the three chicks in the background going, shoop, shoop, and the trombone player, and on and on and on. Look at me already, even as I talk about it. Yeah, I start to get flare up, you know? Dave is the greatest partner I've ever had. I mean, I've had people that I've worked with creatively, people that I've directed with, people that I've written with. He's the greatest partner, really, that I could... I, I just feel that we've, we've got something special going, and, and it's, it's totally pleasurable to work in this environment for me. There's always a big risk when you're gonna leave a big band like when I left Van Halen. And I didn't want to leave Van Halen. It was my intention to make a band, to make a record, and to go on the road, just like I always did. And when that band turned into Spinal Tap, got fat and sloppy, and didn't want to go on the road anymore, and didn't really want to go in and record, you know, take a year, year and a half to record. What? This is rock and roll, man. I think everybody was waiting with bated breath, like, what was David gonna do? I think most people assume that just being the type of person that he is, that he would fall on his feet because he wouldn't let it be otherwise. But uh, I felt really bad, you know. I thought, here this guy, you know, left the major pinnacle, you know, of the band after being together so long. I mean, they really had been together for years. I was forced into a position of, I got to make a move. I looked at my producer, Ted Templeman, who's been through this a million times, you know, and said, uh, Hey, we got to do something. We have just wasted so much time, and we're not going anywhere. It's, this is the roaring 80s, man. So well, the first thing on, in my mind in the final and foremost was, we're going to start a band. We're going to make a band. And that's the first thing that I did. This band was together within 90 days, 100 days after I left Van Halen. And when he left Van Halen, the entire crew, the entire staff, the entire office staff, I'm talking about maybe in excess of 60 people came with David, uh, except for one drum roadie, and there's a reason for that. David is a great guy to work with. I don't think that anybody out here feels that they work for David, and that's unusual to find when you're, when you're talking about a person of this, you know, who's reached this kind of stardom. I'm not one to sit around and worry about the politics of despair. You know, it, it, it really busted me up that, uh, you know, a lot of good years of work, you know, had come to an end. But beyond that, you got to go with it. I'm adventuresome, you know. Because everything that I feel and everything I think and everything that motivates me, all the answers to all of your questions are in my songs. So, brothers... Originally, it was a team designed to paint houses to make beer money in college. <laughs> that was the name of the company. And when we started to make videos, my partner Pete Angelus and I, uh, we started to develop a style, a specific, a very focused kind of style that you could recognize. It was distinctive. So. We decided we'd give it a name in true American tradition. <laughs> and Picasso Brothers, specifically, right. indicates two really separate factions. And we're going to get a little bit zen here, folks. But what you have is Picasso, which suggests high art or fine art. And when you attach the word brothers to it, it sounds like pizza delivery. <laughs> and the combination is rock and roll to me. Hey, that to me is rock and roll sense of humor, you know? Some weight. No, I gained 80 pounds! Man, no fooling. Where you hunting? Making a video is a completely different and totally unique school and way of thinking than from making an album. It's a whole different batch of homework to do and a whole different set of rules and techniques and things to be learned before you even get to first base. What the Picasso brothers decided to do was make the very best videos that we could in terms of a big art project. You know, and if it was finger painting one day, fine. If it's Mona Lisa the next, that's fine. Rock and roll's a combination. You know, it's gotta be. And uh, then if people really just liked to watch what was on that screen, if they liked the story, if they liked the characters and everything, We'll sell a record. Well, the Picasso Brothers entity is very interesting, I think. It's a perfect 
matchup because David, obviously the West Coast suntan California boy, uh, and I'm from the East Coast, so we disagree on everything. Therefore, by the time we get one idea on paper that we both like, we know that it's going to work, or at least it works for us. But uh, the fabulous Picasso brothers, to me, or the work that we do at least, is kind of a cross between the Wizard of Oz and Ben-Hur. All right, all right, I'll do it. Gentlemen, I'll have a turkey on rye with Swiss. Throw in the rest of the turkey in a bucket of tofu. And... Maybe he was the fat man, you never know. You know, it was funny because when I walked out on the set, I couldn't find David Roth, but... Uh, I was never standing with the fat man and David at the same time. And uh, I don't know, the fat guy, we became friends in the, you know, in the video after directing him for three days. I'm not sure though, I, I have a feeling that yes, the fat man was David. And if it was, I think he did a tremendous job, don't you? So when you see the Picasso brothers work, I think it immediately jumps off the screen and people can say, now there is something ridiculous. Instantly you can recognize that. And that makes it fun, I think. But to do the videos, you really have to step out. You gotta have bigger ears than a mouth. And then, you know, you learn your way through that. Um, most bands, I'd say 99.5% bands don't do anything beyond sit on a couch while the director or the production team tells them, and then, Joe, you're gonna jump from the rooftop. And when he sings, on the roof, you'll peek around the corner. What do you say, kid? <laughs> it's like the director thinks he knows something that's going to be popular with people, so every video's got it. One day it's computer graphics, next day it's uh, the Picasso girls. You know, you watch every video go by, you know, and it's like acid flashbacks, you know, each one's got the same thing. Chick dancing in a cage, chick in a cage, there's another girl in a cage. You know, and goes by and everything. I says, well, I'll tell you what, you know, because I've spent so many hours sitting around the living room, have a beer, you know, talk to whoever the company is around the thing and going, making fun of it. I says, let's make fun of it on film. Every time I look at the videos, I wonder uh, about how he could translate that onto a future film. And I'd really like to see how that certain style that him and uh, Pete Angelis have, have gotten preserved on that on video because it's very funny, you know, and that, that's one of the... Uh, neat things I think about David is that he really doesn't take himself all that serious. I think there's some Marx Brothers in it for me. I think there's a little bit of Fellini. I like a strange twist every now and then. Uh, there's some Polanski in it for me. There's some early taxi driver in it for me. I don't know. It's a combination of a lot of styles. And I don't think that we get any of them right. That's what makes it so special. Yes, we're going to play a game. But we'll view it as a sharing experience. <laughs> and I think people get that out of my songs. They understand that. So even though it's the most licentious, fairly dripping stuff sometimes, I don't know, when I watch it back out on the street, it looks like a seven-year-old being rude. I expect it's good work if you can get it. <laughs> best is on stage. I got real tired of a lot of my peer group rock and roll <clears throat> freaking out and losing a whole week, having a nervous breakdown because the monitor didn't work exactly right one night. Or maybe the guitar amp isn't exactly the right sound one night or something like that and there's a big screaming belligerent brawl <laughs> after the show about a lot of damage. I mean, not fun damage, but I mean like, you know, Hit your face on a wall, you know, that kind of thing. Um, I put my money where my mouth was. I figured, am I really better than this, or am I just turning into a limo rat? <laughs> when we were with Van Halen, we always had the largest productions, and I think primarily that was because of David. I mean, David always felt that uh, if you're going to sell a ticket for $15 or however much, you've got to give the kids their, their dollars worth. I mean, you've got to make it special. It's got to be something they can remember from the second that they walk into the hall to the second that they leave. And Dave, this time, has just allowed us to do exactly what we want. I mean, for years we battled about the size of the production. Let's not spend the money. Let's spend the money. This time, we could do exactly what we wanted. And obviously, 
we put together the largest show on earth. Yeah, we're going into the Guinness Book of World Records on this tour. It's the 97 tons tour, we call it. That's 97 tons in the air alone. And when you add up everything else, the stage weight and et cetera, et cetera, you're talking almost a half a million pounds, 120 people to move this colossal thing around the United States and, and the rest of the world. And uh, if that's not enough to get in the Guinness Book of World Record, he's going to add more, ladies and gentlemen. <laughs> I get the best of both worlds, you know. I can tie my hair up under my hat, you know, and dress down, and I walk by night. <laughs> That's when I do my research. I am the watcher instead of the watched for a change. And I think that's important to have because isolation, solitude is a real sweet drug, man. And then the music becomes vapid and unidimensional because of that. How many songs can you write about groupies and room service? How many people out in the audience really experience that and can relate directly to it beyond novelty value once or twice anyways? And a lot of bands burn themselves up because of this, you know. You know, I don't know him all that personally to, to know what he does, you know, in his spare time, but I have a feeling he probably does. You know, every time I've seen him just about, he seems like he's in the fast lane, so to speak. When people talk about the fast lane, they flatter themselves and they say, yeah, I live in the fast lane as if they are moving fast. No, 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 no. The fast lane is like an escalator. It's the floor that's moving. It's all you can do to hang on, to keep up, all right? You gotta keep up, man. It ain't like you get there and sit and go. You know what happens to people do that. And that's what happened to my last band, is in fact, here's a little metaphysics for you. Perhaps it was them who moved away from me by standing still. Obviously, fans didn't take long to accept the new Hagerized Halen. 30 seconds into the first song, I got hit with about 20 big giant banners rolled up. As I start unrolling them, looking at them, David Lee who, <clears throat> you know, some other rude statements, and it really, you know, it, I can honestly say it encouraged me. David Lee Roth found plenty of encouragement on his Eat em and Smile tour. At five months and counting, it was definitely one of the year's longest and craziest, and it was sort of a multi-leveled performance, too. Come listening for the guitar hero, we have that. You come looking for dancing feet, we have that. You want Dave close to you? Yes, we have that. But that's not all. Van Halen and David Lee Roth battled it out on the charts and in the press with a no-holds-barred media feud. Well, of course the Van Halens are gonna be angry at me, you know, because it's a big divorce, man, it's a big divorce. Who came first? Who said the first? You said this about me, and then I said, no, you said it first. It's gonna go back and forth, and it reads like wrestling, man. It reads like Hulk Hogan, you know, and it's colorful. And hey, I'll read this stuff, it's colorful. Sammy Hagar, on the other hand, is upset with me because he knows I'm better than he is. And hailing a bunch of sick little morons. Ha, that's a quote. We didn't make that up. In the August issue of Playboy, in a 20 Questions interview, Dave also talks about maybe doing his own talk show. Nice idea. Going on, taking on head-to-head -head with Tipper Gore and PMRC, talking about the differences between his onstage and offstage selves. A lot of interesting stuff there. Uh, but his most outspoken comments, Dave calls Van Halen, and this is another quote, little time people making little time music in a little time band. A man doesn't have a lot of ruth. Although he says he has fond memories of those early struggling years with the boys, August Playboy is on sale today, so run out and get it and read more. Favorite subject. It wasn't the creative part of working with him. I think we made some great music together. And uh, it was just living with the guy. He treated everybody like a li little lower than him, including us in the band. And, you know, that's, that's not the way a band works. When I read somebody putting it down and saying, ah, that was no good, ah, that music stunk or anything, that makes me feel like sad, you know? That's like somebody take you out to dinner and you think you had a great time, and at the end of the night they go, hey, you know what, I had a really lousy time. And you know what? You're lousy too, but thanks for dinner. Well, I just want to say, we, fl we flipped the bill for all those dinners. <laughs> we paid for it. It's going to go back and forth, and it reads like wrestling, man. It reads like Hulk Hogan, you know, and it's colorful. 
And hey, I'll read this stuff, it's colorful. Sammy Hagar, on the other hand, is upset with me because he knows I'm better than he is. Well, look at all the people here tonight. That's my stupid impression of David Lee Roth. Wherever he goes, there's a party. And tonight, the party's in Little Rock, Arkansas. David Lee Roth. Hey, anybody out there up for a bottle of anything and a glazed donut? Yours truly, David Lee Roth, right here, broadcasting short distance from me to you from the heartlands of America. Yeah, I've got a hot date with 12,000 of my closest friends tonight, but before I talk about that, I want to talk to you about the rich, bulging pageantry that is the MTV Awards show. And that's why I'm here, because I'm to bring you the best division of the entire show tonight, the most fabulous Technicolor event ever, the best group video. And the nominees are... Well, it's a very competitive field that we do have out there this evening, ladies and gentlemen. The air is tense with the anticipation, and the winner of the best group video award is... Dire Straits! Dire Straits! Dire Straits! ...schedule to address the issue, but first, let us point out one startling vocal similarity. <laughs> and if you, like, look real closely to his face, I can see where people would ask that, because, like, half of his face looks like mine, and the other half of my face looks like who knows who, you know? But these are questions that we all have to ask ourselves over a period of time. And I think if you just give me a little period of time, I'll get right back. I'll get right back to you. Whether the fat guy is David Lee or not. Actually, I, I wish he was fat. <laughs> you tell me. If it's